Carl Jung told us that all men have within them an anima. I like to see that as my romantic tender side that likes to write poetry and songs. But I find there's a bit of a problem with this. When I look out into the world, I see a little bit too much tenderness and not enough warrior energy. But then I see that the reactionary manly movements are a fair bit off on the energy front as well. They are not really for me. And in my mind, I see that the truly admirable and great men had these two forces united within them. A warrior who can dream. A visionary leader. And today I'm going to talk to you about how anima integration might direct us towards this specific goal. Now, Carl makes a very interesting statement, Mr. Young. He says that in order to become more manly, you need to integrate your anima. Or, if you integrate your anima, it will reinforce your masculinity and make you come across as more manly. And of course, I read this and I think to myself, what the hell are you on about, Carl, you idiot? This, these two things do not compute. They do not go together, manliness and womanliness. How can I be more effeminate and get more manly? That doesn't make sense at all, you plonker. What are you doing? Why are you even writing these books, you weirdo? You know, go, go get a job, Carl. Stuff like, like, what are you doing, man, you freak? Idiot. <laughs> and and I, I have this very visceral manly response to this because I'm a man. I, I like my, my things to be spoken clear. I like, I, like, I like people to be like straightforward with what they're trying to say. I don't like them talking these riddles. What does is, what is Jung think he is? Like some type of Buddhist with his koans. Like, F off, Carl. <laughs> but of course, I, I thought about this a little bit. I guess my, my manliness has a conscience. I, I sort of have a civilized side. I'm like a civilized barbarian. I thought to myself, all right, well, look, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt since so many people read him. Like, mm, there's probably something to it. And so I think about it. I think about it a little bit. Like, how how can I compute this this paradox of effeminacy? Marrying to the profound masculinity and creating masculinity. That's just, that doesn't make sense. But when you think about it, and I think about it in the way that I understand things. I think about chads. I think about super badass champions. I think about people like Lomachenko, one of the best fighters in the world. You know, a champion boxer, super chad thing. The only thing I really pay attention to is like chad things. And he's one of those chad things I pay attention to. And I actually know his story a bit. And I thought about his story. A super chad man. You see, when he was learning to box and become a dangerous beast of violence who could beat the hell out of you, his dad didn't just send him to boxing clubs straight away. His dad actually sent him to dancing class. That was actually where he started. His dad said, you're not even allowed to go to boxing class. You're going to have to learn to dance first. Now, of course, if I was there as a man and I heard his dad say, I would probably actually take Lomachenko off his dad and slap his dad and be like, what are you doing sending him? You're trying to turn him gay. You're trying to make him a bender. What are you doing? You can't send him to dancing class. That's for women. That's effeminate. Blech. Blech. <laughs> And I would confiscate his child for such a proposition. But of course, I would have been wrong because his dad sent Lomachenko to dancing class for a reason because dancing gets you to be very light on your feet and very coordinated with your body. And so what you actually notice then is that Lomachenko's standout quality is his ability to move his feet. His footwork is amazing. He can teleport all around people and you're getting like punched from here and you turn around to see what's going on and you're like punched in the stomach and then he's like punching you in the back of the head because he's moving around you so quick. He's like a, a bee. He's like a bee trying to dominate a flower. <laughs> and so... Um, this comes from his magic footwork. So when he began, he, he learned this very feminine, yeah, this very, very weak, feminine, girly little dancing thing. And he got really, really good with his feet. And in this, when he put, a, he married that feminine skill to this masculine power of using his hands for the implications of violence. He, when he married these two things together, he became the champion of the world, the most dangerous man in all of boxing. Now, that's an incredible thing when you think about it, because like, as I would understand, because I'm a man, so I like things straightforward. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what is a man? A man is a badass who wins at everything. So how do I how do I win? How do I become successful? How do I become the champion of the world? And I would think, well, you just be really manly. 
that's obviously what you would do. So I would wake up and I would, I, I don't know, like eat 40 steaks and I would just growl. I would just shout at the mirror. I'd shout at anybody in the house for me and I'd just beat them up as like practice, as warm up. And then I'd go to the boxing gym and i just hurt everyone and hurt everything. My coach tries to coach me. I'm just like, bang. And then I go into, the, you know, you just be super manly, high testosterone. Everything's loud. Everything's aggressive. Everything's mean. And you'd imagine that would be what would get me to championship, you know, just pure aggression, pure assertiveness and whatnot. And certainly there's a place for that type of stuff. But no, of course, that would have me burn out. That would have me fail eventually. A lot of that stuff would go wrong. A lot of these traits are fantastic and often needed in this world of ours. But they're not um, they're not actually as 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 suggestive as, of success as we would think. Where someone like Lomachenko, who pr- pr- practiced these more feminine arts, would come along and dominate me because I'd be all stiff and aggressive and full of cortisol and full of uh, full of all this energy and this tension and whatnot, and he would just batter me around the place. And so it seems like success is not necessarily defined on being manly. It is actually defined on being married of all the traits that are required to reach the success. Whatever, whatever you need to get to success is, is not ideological. It is not something you can pre-decide. You must always think to yourself, I'm trying to become successful and whatever, whatever traits that I can gather up from my reality can contribute towards this. So if it involves me having to go to learn to dance, maybe I'll do it. And I'll do it like a man, and I'll embrace it, and I'll dance like a Chad. I'll be a Chad dancer. I'll make my manliness marry the feminine. And then this really got me thinking, because I'm a man who had a profound mind. So I, I thought to myself, wow, that is really something. I'm glad I figured that out. What a genius I am. And then I, I really thought about it, and I said, you know, to myself, I said, this is excellent, because this reminds me of the successful people I admire in history have this blend and combination of traits. Julius Caesar, Julio Cesare, master of the Roman Empire, he had a high-pitched voice, you know? And if I was to imagine what I would like Julius Caesar to be, he'd be like a, a giga chad with like a super deep voice speaking in Latin, speaking out among the plebs and leading them towards a great future. But of course, he has a squeaky high-pitched voice and you could disqualify him as like having an effeminate or nerdy or squeaky voice and say, why should I pay attention to him? I'm a little, I'm a a bloke walking around Rome. Why should I pay attention to Julius Caesar? Sounds like a plonker. He sounds like a weak, effeminate idiot. But of course, if I did that, I would have missed out on one of the greatest campaigns in all of human history. Same with Napoleon. Napoleon was a shorty. He was a little short dude. Little midget man, little little Napoleon tapping on the head. Oh, good little Napoleon! But of course, Napoleon almost conquered all of Europe. He was the emperor over France, a leader over all of France. He was crowned king after they had abolished kings. He was a very, very chad man. He was a little midget, and can I disqualify him on his midgetness on this trait? Instead, I should be expecting my, my leader, my Ubermensch, to be 27 feet tall and, 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 and geared up on testosterone. Instead, I get a little midget who knows how to use cannons. But of course, that is what is required for success. And it says a lot to us about what success really is and what we should model success in in our mind. So all this had me contemplating on my journey towards anima integration and I was anxious, I was worried, looking over my life, am I on the course to integrate some weird type of effeminate trait that will lead me towards championship and excellence? And I realised that my journey, for me, sort of began in college. You know, I've talked about this before in the context of individuation, but this is sort of a different angle. You see, college is quite an interesting thing when you first come out of the family home and the the order of of school and stuff like this and the planned meals and stuff like this and the college is the first time you're thrust out on your own and having to organize everything by yourself having to 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 set forth and 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 put your intention and put your will put your manly will towards getting things done and sorting things out in this regard and so college was that experience for me and i remember it was so difficult because i had no purpose i had no plan i had no anime integration plan, I had no individuation plan, I had none of this stuff set out and forth of me that I could just follow and do and turn my mind off. I had to figure it all out for myself. And so the only thing I could really do is go back towards my instincts, pay attention to my instincts and notice what they requested of me, what they demanded, what they want. And, you know, the instincts boil out of your body and they, 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 they decorate your mind with visions and imaginations and hopes. And so this is, this is what I was sort of going towards. And I'd noticed that the, the only thing my, my, 
my instincts really wanted is they wanted me to integrate as many animas as possible. They would always say to me, anima, as much anima as you possibly can in as the highest quantity and quality as you can. Always as much, just a stack of anima, if you will, a bucket of anima, whatever you can. So it was a very pious youngin when you think about it. And the problem with this is that the instincts sort of dangle the anima in front of me and say, just go get that. If you just get, if you just integrate that anima, everything's going to be all right. But of course, it's hard. It's hard to just integrate the anima randomly. So you have, there's a couple of like proceeding steps towards it. So for example, you have to go to the place where all the anima is. And so I would always think, well, where, where would I go to a place where there's anima? I'm here in college. Like, what do I do? And of course, I'm just like, well, you go to parties and stuff like this. So college was kind of perfect for this because I didn't have to go to, to classes at all. And maybe I could because I might integrate a few animas there if I could but nonetheless you, you, there's like plenty of opportunity plenty of places to go to to integrate your anima it's, it's actually c kind of well set up for that um, and you, like all the education stuff you can just brush to the side like what use is that and um and then there's also another problem that started to derivative, come out of that uh, derivatively, derivatively. The next problem was the, 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 the respect you needed because in order to get attention off, off the anima, in order to get the, the flattering um, love of the anima, in order for that to shine down upon you, you of course need to, you need to be high status. You need to be, uh, people need to respect you. People need to think you're cool. And so that's always a challenge. How do you do that? Is it a way you present yourself? Is it a way you dress yourself? Do you have like style and all this? In order for you to get the anima, do you have to have some type of magnetic quality that draws them towards you, that, that everybody pays attention to you? When you go to the parties, everybody looks and it's like, oh my God, that's the guy. That's the guy with all the cool stuff, with all the cool vibe and whatnot. And so I, I would wrap up in my mind. It's like, how do I, how do I get that kind of cool vibe so that the anima, all the animas want to integrate with me? How do I do this? And so my conclusion was, well, I want to make cool stuff and this sort of postulated and formed in my mind very very unconsciously the plan that I was going to follow I was going to make cool stuff so that I could go to parties and people would be like oh that's the guy who makes cool stuff and I'd have a cool vibe and then all the animas would notice that everyone's paying attention to me and then they'd all want to integrate with me which is fantastic it's a perfect plan when you think about it and um, so this was the plan I invoked. Now, college was great for this because I could just stay in my room all day and make, try to make cool stuff and I didn't have to waste any time going to classes or anything like that. I could go to classes and then try to talk to animas within that context. It was like free anima integration classes everywhere all the time with all these random topics like some dude at the top of the class would talk about. Now... I sort of noticed after a while that making cool stuff is harder than I thought. It is actually kind of hard to make cool stuff. Um, so I started to think to myself, how can I, my stuff is not good enough. I'm not making cool enough stuff and people are not respecting me and therefore the animals are not noticing and getting attention and then wanting to integrate. So how do I make more cool stuff? How do I make my, my stuff cooler? How do I make it better? So what I would say to myself is, right, I'm in this big institution. I'm in this big college. What I could do is I could go and I could, there, there's like, obviously if it's an education institute, there's places I can go that will teach me skills that will help me make cooler stuff. There must be a place around here that will teach me school, skills to help me make stuff better. So I would go into, I'd actually go into the lectures and listen to the people talking instead of focusing on the animus. So I go into the lectures, I would listen to the people talking and they would all talk. They, none of them would ever talk about skills, about, they, they would never sit down and say, all right, this is how you make cool stuff. This is how you put together something cool so that you can present it to people in parties or, or, or whatever, and then animals will pay attention to you. No, that would never happen. They would never say, this is how you make something and put it up on SoundCloud. This is how you dress properly. This is how you speak eloquently. This is how you command your thoughts and create interesting perspectives. There was never any of that crafting, any of that actual like skill orientation thing, things that have real impact in the world, none of that stuff. I would go in and I would sit down in these lecture halls and these people would walk up. He's like, you know, I'd be like, who are these people? These people didn't integrate any animals. None of them had integrated animals. They would walk up and they would just start talking in these like magic weird words, like all these big complex words, deconstructionism, postmodernism, critical theory. I was doing a liberal arts degree, critical theory, um, Marxist critique, um, feminist theory, Judith Butler, uh, Derrida, all this type of stuff. They would just they would just splatter out jargon and then they would go up and they point at this big thing on the screen that was just like all more jargon. And they'd say this, this is really, really important. And it's this is important that you want. This is cool stuff. And I'm like, bro, that's. In my mind, I'm like, bro, that's not cool stuff. And I, I really doubt any animas are that interested in integrating with you 
because you know all, because you talk about all this stuff. Like, I don't really think so at all. So they talk about all this jargon, they recite all this jargon, but it really, I don't know, really didn't kind of click with me at all. I felt, I felt deep down in my soul, I felt there was something bad about it. And I noticed that they were always talking about this thing called the West, the Western canon and all this type of stuff. They're saying, this is really, really bad. This is, the, this is not good and we need jargon. And jargon is good and jargon is better and we're going we're gonna to get the jargon and the jargon is the right thing. And I was just like, bro, I, I don't want any part of this at all. This is weird. I don't really like this stuff at all. I need to be able to make cool stuff. I need, I need power. I need skill. I need energy. I need kind of dazzling stuff and whatnot. Now, what I started to notice is that there was one particular dude who they would always bring up, who they all, all liked, these, these jargonites, these lecturers and, all, and whatnot. They would always bring up this, this dude who was really, really good at making cool stuff, this guy called Nietzsche. Now, they loved him because he critiqued this thing called the Western canon. He was really mean to it. He called it all stupid. He, he called the West. He said that he deconstructed it, is what they always said, which was a good thing, apparently. Um, but I read through him, and he, I noticed he had, he had really, really good quotes. You know, He had these really, really good takes and quotes and whatnot. And I, I was kind of thinking to myself, wow, if I could sort of talk like this dude, um, that would be cool. And then I could go to parties and then I could talk in this cool way and then I could integrate my anima. And and that was that was sort of kind of clicking in my head when I read through this guy. He, he was very short. He was to the point. He didn't use jargon. Well, he used some jargon, but he wasn't crazy with it. He was very like to the point. He, he had these little well-spoken things. There weren't these big volume essays of just jargon and nonsense and all this. He was very, very to the point. So I was like, I like this dude. I like this Nietzsche guy. He's quite good. And so I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, if I could learn to talk with that type of style that he has, with that type of vibe, with that type of energy, energy that would be a good thing so how do I do this what's the skills underneath this how do I actually produce out of myself this character this personality this ability to speak and I I, I was looking for something and I, I didn't really know what it was and I couldn't I couldn't really figure out how I do this there, there was no straightforward plan put together and whenever I go to college and all this and look at all the classes that they had not, none of it really explained any of it it was all just jargon it was all just knowledge there was no there was knowledge in college but there was no actual coherent plan that that would teach me how to make good 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 speech and good stuff so that I can in integrate the anima this was kind of irking at me quite a lot it was really getting in the way of my plan so what I started to do in a very grug way is I would take Nietzsche and I would look at the, the the phrases that were really cool by him and I would take them and I would copy them over and I would write them over it was almost like I was trying to copy and install his way of speaking into my words but there's always this problem every time I'd install my words I would try to put them into me I'd memorize his words the style wouldn't be there there was this like way this way of thinking or way or there's something there was like there's an energy inside of his words that were that was really really cool and, and and had style but I couldn't I couldn't get that out of his his words I would copy his words into my head but I couldn't get the style out how do you get the style out it was like it was like this problem I was having and I was really it was really annoying because I saw that, like the, the the people with the, who who were who were like the people who I admired they all had this sort of natural style this character this personality this sort of energy about them they were animated they were shining and the anima would all be magnetized and it was awesome and all this and so I didn't know what I was looking for. And of course, during college, um, one of one of a very, very common thing you're gonna come across are drugs, especially psychedelics, things like um LSD and like M MDMA, which is sort of psychedelic in its nature, and weed in a way as well. But I would notice that um when when I would when I would smoke maybe weed or maybe I take a little bit of MDMA, like my mind would drastically change. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes I would get these flickers of this 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 quick thinking is the only way I could describe it. I had this way of thinking where where it felt like my thoughts are just rushing out of me. It was rushing out of me. And, and I noticed that when I was in groups and stuff like this and, and I was maybe high and this part of my mind was switched on and, and stuff was rushing out of me, I'd noticed that people would all pay attention to me. And it was like there was this magnetic power. It was like there was something being born out of me. There was animated powers flooding out of me. It was like some type of goddess was coming out of me and speaking through me. And then everybody would magnetize to it. And most importantly, the animas would all pay attention and think, that is some cool stuff. That guy's a cool guy. I like his vibe. I might, I might help him integrate. And so I would notice this happen every now and again. And I kind of think to myself, you know, that's kind of close to it. That's what, that's what I feel out of this Nietzsche guy's words. That's what I feel out of it. So 
How do I how do I get that spark? How do I get that muse to stay with me more? Because I noticed that when the muse was there, when the, the animated energy was inside of me, when she she was with me and I was letting this stuff out and my, my words were original and it was effortless and all this, I would get all this attention. So how do I how do I create this in me? Because this is like the missing link. If I create this animated energy, if I get this muse within me, then cool stuff comes out naturally, people respect me, and then I can integrate animus. So it was kind of coming together for me at this point. But I was still struggling, and I was kind of thinking, Jesus, do I have to just keep taking drugs? Like, what do I do? Like, this is this is a bit stressful. If I keep taking drugs, like, this kind of might fuck me up. I was My diet was in a terrible state at this point. I was having, like, oscillating problems with depression and mental health because I was taking massive doses of, of various different drugs, including alcohol and stuff like this, and partying all night, not sleeping properly, and eating the, like, worst food you could imagine. Um, but, but I got this idea in my mind that if I could just take a really, really big dose of a really strong psychedelic, I could... I could the anima like I could switch on the muse permanently. I could just turn that part of my mind on. It could it could blow blow it open and give me that style permanently. So I took a huge dose of LSD by myself and I had a crazy experience and it just blew my mind open and I saw all this crazy stuff and all these visions and whatnot. So gods in the sky and I got chased by bulls and stuff like this, actual bulls. And uh, that's that's a story for another time. But what I noticed afterwards is that, that 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 part of my mind was turned on even after the trip went away. Okay, so the trip fades and usually what would happen is the, the muse would go away as well. But this time instead, the, 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 this part of my mind was like fertile, it was alive, it was now shining. The muse was actually on my shoulder and she was, she was speaking through me. And I could, I could just write poems and there was no copy or pasting, there was no installing Nietzsche's words. It was just coming out of me very, very fluidly and naturally. And I was like, wow, this is amazing, holy crap. And I could draw pictures and I didn't even have to like, like think of an idea. All these ideas would flood out of me. And it's like, holy shit, she's here. Oh my God, the muse is here. The animated power is coming out of me and the animas are going to pay so much fucking attention to me. Oh my God, they're going to integrate with me all night. <laughs> so I was like super hyped up about this. And this lasted for a while. I had this flourishing, pouring, outpouring of creativity. It was absolutely beautiful, but it died off eventually. It actually kind of faded and, and, and flickered away and disappeared. And I lost, the, the muse left. The muse left again and suddenly I was sort of dead and I was kind of back to feeling sterile. I felt like my mind was grey and I couldn't create cool stuff and I couldn't get this stuff out. And I got a bit jaded. And then, of course, but at this point, I was going into college and they were still stuck at the whole let's talk about jargon on the wall phrase. Oh, let's read the magic books. And it's like, shut up, guys. Oh, my God, you're the worst. This is so stupid. This is so unpractical. You don't have any idea what you're doing. Like, you're all losers. You clearly have never even left this Oedipal institution. Like, what are you even doing here? Why am I listening to you? So anyway, I'm going to them. They're still stuck at the same place. They're not giving me any help. There's no practical skills. I'm kind of thinking to myself, I can't just keep taking massive doses of psychedelics to keep the keep the muse on my side. That will kind of like I've heard many stories about people getting getting fucked up but it kind of faded and I, I'm not able to do this stuff myself so I started to obsess a little bit and everybody was spiraling down the drug direction as well around me and the drugs are starting to get harder they're moving away from LSD and more towards things like cocaine and whatnot and I was like, bro, I just want to make cool stuff. I just want to get this muse back online as well so I'm able to make cool stuff and get the fucking anima to integrate with me. So I decided to drop out. I decided to drop out of college. I decided to actually like completely plug myself out and go and take all this free time, take all the time that I should be in college and actually learn practical skills. I actually went out and I found mentors. I found uh, musicians who would teach me. I found poets and I got them to teach me how to write. I found writers to teach me how to write and communicate so they could teach me to talk like Nietzsche and musicians to teach me the art of, of uh, the skill of, of making music and whatnot. I went out and I sought all this stuff. I actually chased it down. I said, I'm going to take all the effort and time and pressure of stuff like college and I'm actually going to work out a way to, to fund myself and go forward and whatnot. So I dropped out and I began to chase chase skills because I, I kind of understood if I can install skills, not Nietzsche's words, but if I can ta install skills, then I'll be able to talk in this magic way. I'll be able to get this this spark that came through the psychedelics and make it permanent. And so I dropped out and I did that and I continued um, going through it and, and practicing all these skills. Now, I didn't actually have my old habits really, really dropped out of me. I also still had this sort of vague idea that um, there's probably something to the knowledge. Like if I got knowledge inside of me that was correct, it would help me speak in a more interesting and, and character driven way. So what I, what I did is I... 
I understood that, like, I heard this idea that Nietzsche was like the end of this thing called the Western canon. So all these, the Jargonites were always giving out about the Western canon, saying it was like phallogocentric and too manly and too masculine and, and all this type of stuff and, and too logical and made too much sense. So they hated it. So they wanted to destroy it. So I, and, and Nietzsche was like the final dude. He was like the dynamite that blew up the whole thing and destroyed it and got rid of it. This is why they loved him. And so I sort of understood it was like Nietzsche at the top of this spine or something like this. And I was thinking, and they were all saying, you won't really understand Nietzsche until you, you know all this other stuff. So I was thinking, could, if, could I read my way all the way up through this? Could I read my way all the way up through this spine and get to Nietzsche at the top? And then, boom, I, if I'll do that and I'll have, the, I'll have this ability to talk like Nietzsche and then I'll get more anima. So this was like another project that was running alongside of it. So I was like working on my skills and then reading through the Western canon. I went with Plato. I dropped out, went with, got, got all the books, uh, got Plato and got, uh, went all the way up through this type of stuff. I'm built my way all the way up until I got to Nietzsche and read all the way through it and thus spoke Zarathustra was my goal the most poetic Nietzsche book and so I worked my way all up to it and I sat down and I read thus spoke Zarathustra I was working on my skills I was building all this type of stuff up and I thought I'll read thus spoke Zarathustra I read through it I didn't understand anything I just did the same old thing copy and paste the cool quotes hope that they kind of stay within me and change my mind and whatnot and I wrote all this stuff out and then I kind of sat there afterwards after I was finished and I was like, please, please, just let the let the power, let the spark come back. Let that, that shining animated mind come back. Please, please, please. And then I'll get the animas and it'll be fucking awesome. And nothing happened. I read the Thus Spoke Zarathustra and nothing came out and it kind of sucked. And I was like a bit let down and I was thinking, okay, that this 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 didn't didn't work at all. This didn't work at all. Damn, this is this is disastrous. And so I didn't really know what to do. I just kept on learning the skills because that's kind of all I really knew at this point. I didn't really have anything else going on. And then I, I just kept on reading the Western canon vaguely. I, I, I didn't really have a plan at this point. I couldn't get this spark back. I couldn't get the muse back. And then I came across Jung. Jung was sort of the next step after Nietzsche. Like you have Nietzsche and then you have Freud. And I had read Freud in college. He was one of the Jargonites and all this. The Jargonites loved him. And then there was Jung and he was a bit weird. And he talked about like archetypes and stuff. And I picked up his books and I like skipped through it. And it's like archetypes. It's like Jung, shut up with your jargon. Like get to the point. I need to integrate animas and I need to integrate them fast. And I need you to help me get the spark so that I'm able to integrate the animas. So could you hurry up, please? And then I would um I would go through all this type of stuff and I would look through Jung. And a lot of it is impractical, but I would try to find stuff. It's like, Young, just explain to me something I can do pragmatically that will actually get me to get the, the spark in there so that I can integrate the animas. I need to make cool stuff so I can go to parties and get attention and all this. And I came across a couple of passages and one was quite interesting where he said, if you read your dreams with a serious intent, you will encourage the individuation process. And I kind of read through this and I was like, well, fuck it, at least he's being practical. I guess I'll try this. I'll see what's going on with the Swiss weirdo. And so I actually sat down and I started to read my dreams a lot. And I read my dreams a lot and I noticed that what would happen is the, the dreams are sort of very, very close to that flashing mind. So when the muse was on my shoulder when I was taking psychedelics and drugs, it was like my, my imagination was sparked and turned on and I could see, I could think in pictures. And then for that reason, I could almost let the pictures take control of my mind and then my, 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 my voice would follow the pictures and I would be talking through, um, talking through my imagination. I'm like almost seeing what I'm speaking about and my speaking is, is connected to that type of thing. And when I would read my dreams a lot, it was a very similar experience. And I noticed that as I read them more and more and more and more and more, it would start to increase the amount of times that this spark would happen during the day. So what would happen is eventually I'd read my dreams a bit and then I'd have flickers of imaginative thinking happening during the day. And it was like that spark was back and I was, I was super interested. I was like, whoa, it's like the muse popped down on my shoulder for a brief second. And I was like, whoa, there you are. And then she fucks off again. And I'm like, bitch. And so I started to do it more and more and more. And then the, 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 the muse would show up more. The anima would show up more. The dreams would show up more and I would I would read my dreams and read my dreams and it would almost be like it was like it was starting to become permanent. It would start to show up more and more and more to the point where it was like she was always there. She was like sitting on my shoulder and I was absolutely um, I was absolutely over over myself. I was absolutely beside myself. I was amazed. I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, I'm so sparked. This is awesome. So I have this muse. I have this muse and I have this visual and visionary way of thinking and this is going to help me make cool stuff and I'm going to have all this animated energy and this is going to, I'll be able to just project this energy, I'll be able to make cool stuff, project this energy and then all the animas are going to come, they're going to try to integrate with me 
and and this is precisely what I started to do. I got in this like really good mood. I really felt like grounded in myself. I felt like I had this sort of centered ego and whatnot. I really knew who I was. I knew what I was offering. I knew what I was bringing to the world. It was like, here, here's my animated mind. Here's my animated thoughts. Look at me. I'm sort of like Nietzsche, but not really like Nietzsche at all. I'm actually my own dude. And I just kind of think for myself, here's a funny way of looking at this type of stuff. And I would start to bring that to the world. And people would be mag, people would be, people would be drawn to it like a beast of honey. It was, it was this awesome feeling. And animas would notice it and animas would want to integrate and that was fantastic that was something i really really enjoyed and i was i was super chuffed i was super chuffed and it felt like i had kind of gone through this big journey and got to a very very like i got to like the the the, the end goal i've got to the level I've, I've i've achieved something i've got somewhere this is fantastic i've reached the end i've, I've achieved development i've individuated i've got the animas and i've integrated with uh, integrated with them i've got the muse on my shoulder and she's helped me do all this stuff and i'm letting my stuff out in an original way this is awesome this is awesome and even, I even got a girlfriend. I got an anima to hang around with me for, for a long time. And this was great. This was the best things ever. And so I was kind of thinking to myself, God, I, I've, 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 really, I've really got somewhere. This is awesome. People are kind of hanging around me. But I wasn't quite finished yet. Now, now that I had the muse on my shoulder, now that I had this animating energy shooting out of me, now that I had magnetized, I had hypnotized many animas and I even had an anima, anima by my side and we were in a relationship together. Me and my anima were, were relating and we were integrating together. There was, there was a couple of difficulties because this is a now a more mature problem. You know, the fine art of getting attention is one thing, but the, the art of sustaining it and making it fertile and, 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 and uh, comprehensive long term, that's a difficult challenge. And this this became quite a significant challenge for me. I noticed that once the honeymoon period had gone, we started to, me and my anima started to bicker, started to clash heads and whatnot. And eventually she dumped me. Eventually she, she broke up with me. And I, I, I reflected upon this. It was a very, very difficult thing to take. It's difficult when the anima says, I no longer wish to integrate with you. That, that sucks. You're kind of like, wait a second, anima. That, that's, that, that wasn't in Jung's script. What the hell is going on here? But this happened. This happened and this was a great challenge for me. And I tried to figure out why this happened and I noticed that it was because during this period when I had found this anima when I had the, got the muse and I was able to speak cool stuff and and bring out a lot of energy into the way that I talked it was a little bit up in the air it was a little bit floozy it was a little bit kind of like girly in some type of sense because you see it was all me talking about my dreams it was like a little kid it was me up in my up in the air talking about my dreams talking about all the stuff that I'm going to get done talking about all this cool stuff that I'm going to make talking about these all these big ideas all this amazing music I'm going to make all these great plans that I have all these dreams that I have and this is all great because most people are sort of quietly desperate they're dead they have they've stuck in jobs that they don't like they don't have any dreams they don't have any visions for the future and so there's this like dancing childlike energy in me I had this shining dreaming mind this animated dreaming mind this very very um powerful and magnetic and energetic dreaming mind it's really attractive she even said to me that uh you're like a child but a man all blended together and at once it's a very very interesting way that she would perceive that and that's of course the the energy that i that i would have i had a very very strong energy of this type of thing but it's not very firm it lacks maybe a sort of dynamic of manliness that that, that gets things done if you wish i actually had become i had opened up my feminine side or maybe my childish side so much my dreaming side so much i i had actually lost touch with the the manly qualities that i needed to integrate as well i i these two forces these two opposite forces Forces were now separate and so I was having this challenge I was having this really really serious issue where I was I was having all this magnetic energy but I wasn't getting anything conclusively done I was just talking about my dreams I was talking about how I switched on my ma magnetic dream mind and I had all these big ideas but I was broke I wasn't making any money it wasn't very very pragmatic and I didn't really have any um, vision or, or direction or future that I was going to it's like well the, and my anima was saying well why are we integrating where are we going what's going on and I was sort of saying I just like thinking about my dreams I just like reading my dreams and stuff I just really really like the dreaming type of thing and you know all these big dreams and all magnetic energy the muse all this type of stuff this is great isn't it and she's like yeah yeah it's all great but like what's what's actually happening here like what's your goals where are you going what's your future look like what's your plan what are you actually doing what you're broke like do you have a plan of actually monetizing this dream power like what the hell are you doing like uh, like if this muse is so great why can't you actually use it to be successful in life in some sense and i was like oh well yeah like but like still the energy oh the energy it's so good please understand the energy yeah anima energy yeah and eventually she said, no, no, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. I don't, I don't want this anymore. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, ugh. 
And I was sort of asking her, why is this? Uh, why do you not like this? And I, I wasn't asking her directly, but I was sort of uh, studying her uh, after the fact and trying to understand why, why did she reject this so much? Why did she not want this? And I guess it's because man and woman, how masculinity and femininity need to relate. Masculinity is like the firm um, order. It's the firm drive towards things, if you will. It's the assertive drive. It's the it's the intent energy. It's the manly energy that wants to get something done. It's it's like with Lomachenko. It's like the reason why it's the part of him that wants to hurt the other person and beat them and win. Whereas the feminine energy is more about dancing. And it's not necessarily intent and driven towards a firm goal. It's more about the art of things and doing things beautifully and having things look graceful and and, and beautiful and, and and feminine and these type of things. And these these two things are very very beautiful and powerful but um they're different they're definitely definitely different they're very strongly different as well and so i had a lot of that dancing and graceful energy and all these beautiful big ideas and all these dreams and whatnot but i didn't have a firm drive i didn't have an intent i didn't want to get dirty and 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 into the nitty-gritty and bite down on my teeth and st start throwing hard punches and try to get to the end and win and get to the conclusion and push myself over that edge and what what she felt like is that she was almost like a, a stable force of reality. She was like the one who felt like she had to put together a plan and have a vision. And I was like a little child running around with all my dreams, like running around her like a little kid. And she was like a mother, you know, taking care of a little kid. And this was this was the wrong feeling for her. This this feeling doesn't doesn't feel nice in her because she has to worry about the future and the plans and she had to put everything together with intention. And it's kind of it's not a good feeling. It doesn't make her it doesn't make her it doesn't make her her feminine energy turn on it doesn't make her want to integrate and um, she doesn't make her want to integrate her animus if you will and for example i i would understand if this is sort of my experience of being red pilled with women you know i would understand that what her what her deep soul wants is that she wants to feel like she's getting on board a train and being brought somewhere she wants to feel like she's attaching to a masculine energy because she's a woman she's feminine and so she has actually quite a lot of these feminine traits she doesn't want to have to lead a man somewhere she doesn't want to have to set a vision for me she doesn't doesn't want to have to set a plan for me or anything like that she wants to feel like she's getting on a train and being taken somewhere she wants to feel that i um, the energy i have is this firm intent energy and i'm shooting towards some type of championship and she gets to dance around that and take care of that and help me along that journey she wants to feel like she's a, a planet orbiting a, a, a she wants to feel like a moon orbiting a planet a planet orbiting the sun she wants to feel like she's attaching to something firm and masculine you even think about the the sexual act itself it's you know a firm organ a male organ with intent delivering the information the dna to something that yields around the organ that goes goes around it's 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 um it's 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 a yielding force it's something that then takes the dna and cultivates it and makes it into something if you will and this is this is the essence of these two forces this duality and they they work together in a beautiful way and of course the sort of problem was that she because of the way i was behaving like a a dreaming child with no grounded energy with no firm vision with no intent with no menace in my energy where i wanted to violently make things happen and bully the world into actually making my dreams happen and whatnot. I was sort of a dreaming child out of touch with reality. She felt she felt like she was the male force. She felt like she was the visionary force, the intent force. And it's not good and it's not nice. And it, it didn't didn't sit well with her. And so when she she says, I don't want to integrate anymore, she she ends the integration process and she says, I'm, I'm all gone, gone away. She runs off. The anima runs off. The physical anima runs off. And then this crushes me. And this crushes my soul. And this 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 and then I, I lose my house as well. I lose my job all at the same time. It's a pretty bad uh, month. And I um I get crushed. All of this stuff falls apart and I I I, I the, the integration process is ended and the muse fucks off as well. She says, oh, I'm done with you as well, bro. You're a loser. Actually, yeah, it was kind of fun hanging out, but now you're loser i'm gone too and i get like i get down i get down about myself and i i sit down and i i i have to figure this out i have to understand why did the anima not want to integrate me and it's because i don't have that drive i don't have that firm serious energy and i could only understand it as me all i was was this in the head dreaming child with all this potential and all these up in the air ideas and all this kind of flowery effeminate graceful ideas and all this animated magnetic energy but i had no grounded gravitas i had no firmness i had no solid heavy masculine energy i had no weight to my personality i wasn't serious if i said i have a dream no one would have believed me that i was going to make it happen i had these i have a vision and it's like no one thought that it was really going to turn into anything because i have 400 visions i've had all oh, you had 20 visions this year you don't have any real grounded results 
it's all all your ideas are potential none of it is actualized and I saw that that's what she was looking for. Her her urges, her instincts, her, the things that were guiding me, my instincts, her instincts, the thing that are guiding her. She's looking for that energy of, 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 of standing upon something that is gravity and being carried and being taken on a vision. She wants to be led. And it began to show me what masculinity is, what its true essence is, is having that, that side of things down, having that gravitas in me. And so after that, after that breakup, after I was, uh, the, the integration was over, I was devastated and I, I kind of bit my lip. I became humble. I said to myself, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm going to allow my dreams to pop. I'm actually going to come out of this delusional state and I'm going to come down to earth and pay more attention to the ground and become more serious and actually get stuff done. I'm going to actually develop gravitas. I'm going to become responsible. I'm going to become humble. And this actually forced me to confront some really, really difficult things because, of course, I was broke. And I saw, because I was so into my dreams, I saw all these jobs on all these things as, like, below me. I saw, like, you know, working as, like, a pleb thing that's below me. And I realized that what I've got to do is I've got to actually get out of my head and get out of my dreams and come down to earth and, and make my reality make the most out of the reality around me. I have to accept the reality. I, I stopped being a dreamer and I became a realist. And it was like a popping of the shadow. I had to come down and make everything mundane. I even went through this period where I did not speak any strong opinions for one year. I just turned off all my opinions and I became a, I became a doer. I became an action-orientated person, someone with gravitas. And so I went and I took the most crappy job I could think about. I was working in English teaching and I hated it. I thought it was below me. I was supposed to be a special artist, a dreamer, a big thinker and whatnot. And I let go. I let go of that idea. And I, I let it all drift off. As the anima flew away, I let that all go as well. And I said, right, I'm just going to make the most of the English teaching. That's the only thing I really can do at the moment. I'm just going to accept this and, and take this as this reality. And what was interesting is that that was, a, that was a massive smash in my identity because what was sort of going wrong earlier, when I go, go to, to parties so I can integrate the anima, oftentimes something that would irk me quite a lot is um, people would say, what do you do? Because you want to be cool, you want to be respected. So it was always very easy for me to say, oh, I'm a dreamer who's making all this cool stuff. You know, I'm a musician, I'm an artist, I'm a, I'm a talker, I'm a dreamer, I'm a guy with like this muse on my shoulder and all this. And this is all very flowery and interesting stuff. And people will be like, wow, that's cool. Tell me more and all this. And you could sort of bullshit and you'd get respect and then you'd get in interest from the anima. But I was, I was always very, very afraid of, of actually telling the truth and saying, I'm broke and I don't have anything going for me. I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm a little bit lost. That was always really, really hard to say. And so during this period of my life, I also was uh, like listening to a little bit of Jordan Peterson. So I was getting very, very serious about the idea of, you know, being very bluntly honest and telling the truth and seeing what would happen. And so when I go out to parties and I would I would meet people and that question would come up to sort of like, what do you do? And I'd feel that feeling of <gasps> here it comes. <gasps> What do I say? I'm not a dream. I couldn't say a dreamer anymore. I couldn't say, oh, I, I've, I'm the guy with the muse on my shoulder. And I couldn't say, I'm the guy searching for a spark. I'm the guy who hates jargon. I couldn't say that anymore. Instead, what I'd have to sort of do is say, I teach English. I'd have to take the most boring thing and be realistic and be honest. Yeah, I just teach English. I teach English. Yeah, I'm an English teacher. I'm just a teacher. Yeah, a really like kind of pathetic, low status job. Who, who teaches English? All this type of thing. And I'd have to embrace it. And this became super, super interesting because that was a really humbling and hard thing to do. It was like a firm punch in my mouth. But it was, it was good in some sense because I had a stable income. But it was also very interesting in another because I started to notice as I was going through this period and the haze of, of the breakup and the rejection was starting to clear out. I started to notice that the muse didn't really disappear. She had just, she had been sitting on her shoulder, but my shoulder, but she was now there to apply herself. That She was going to animate whatever I was doing, now that I was moving out of my dreams into reality, she, she was actually able to help me animate my reality now. So for example, I would go into English teaching and I would teach English, but I would take that imagination, that big dreamy mind I had and apply it to English teaching and take this complex jargon, these, all these words, all this education stuff, and I would actually make it really, really fun and interesting for the people doing it. I would use a lot of metaphors and paint a lot of pictures and, 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 and present the stuff really well and people really, really got engaged. And I actually started to do really well quite fast. I got invited to corporations and I was paid very, very well. Paid so much that I was able to work part-time, for example. So I was, I was doing, doing very, very well off the English. I was very, very happy with that. It was, it was excellent. 
it was it was actually kind of strange because I didn't have any like formal qualifications. I was just running purely off reputation. But it actually took me all the way into uh, in, into a corporation. So I was I was very very surprised. It was it was magic really. You know, and it all, and the muse was just helping me the whole way. The anima was just helping me the whole way. That dreaming, sparked, original thinking mind was really, really useful there. I was really able to express my creativity in English. And even though I hated it and I saw it as boring and low status and all this, it started to work. It really became a foundation towards um, my future success. And then I began to notice that when I go to parties and people would ask me stuff like, what do you do? And I learned that what, what I say doesn't have any relationship to how animated I am and how the muse is with me. And so I could say something like, I teach English, but as long as I let my, as long as I, I, I was able to, to, to allow my creative mind, my dreaming mind, my muse to come out in that moment, I didn't, it didn't matter what I did. Like what, what I did to be perceived as cool wasn't that big of a deal. It didn't really, like, I could just say anything. I could be like, I work at McDonald's and flip burgers. But as long as my energy was strong, uh, the anima, all the animas would still want to integrate with me. That was still actually there. That was still possible. That was still something that was absolutely going to, like, that, that they, they, were, they were attracted to me. And they're attracted to the animated energy I had in my soul. Not really the sort of perception I was trying to craft of being a cool dude who had all the dreams and had all the spark and was on this crazy mission and all this type of stuff. I could be a nobody English teacher, but I had good energy and it was a lot of fun. I had character and I had style. And they would like that over whatever label I wanted to present myself as. And I started to learn this. The more I forced myself to tell the truth, the more I began to own my reality and own my truth, if you know what I mean. And the more the muse began to actually appear in really practical, real world things. She, she began to show up in my English teaching. She began to show up in any interaction I had with any anima at all times. And it was actually very, very, very interesting. And it began to really click into gear when I started to notice things because around about this time I had given up on my dreams. I'd stopped trying to think of myself as like an artist, a struggling artist, a musician and all this. I stopped trying to think of myself as this and I started to just allow myself to be a person and what would happen is I'd start to say, I, I almost always had this sort of mental block towards publishing anything that wasn't um, about my dreams and all this and the, and the music and all this. And instead I was able to just go on YouTube, for example, and just start to talk about some stuff that I knew from this journey and all this. I could just rant about what was going on with all this type of stuff. And the muse would show up. I would, it, would, it was quite easy for me to talk in an animated, funny, silly way about a very serious topic that everyone takes so serious. And I noticed that people people will find it funny. People will find it enjoyable, you know. And I would do this. And also because I had this English teaching job that was now paying me well, that I was working part time, I was able to, you know, keep doing the English teaching. And then I could, you know, spend a bit of time focusing on the YouTube videos. And it was, it was a lot of fun. It was like quite an easy way to go about things. I sort of had this creative outlet and I had this English teaching, which was sort of a creative outlet as well. And life was pretty locked in, you know, and I was quite comfortable going out and presenting myself as like literally a nobody. Like I could go up to people at this point and say, yeah, I'm, I'm literally a nobody. I'm li literally homeless. And I would make jokes like this and people would still still sort of like like my energy because the muse is with me. The muse is in my reality now. And then the animus would want to integrate, which is just the best thing ever. Now, what I really derive out of this is the pair of traits that hang within me. The childish dreaming energy, the animated visionary muse energy that's very, very feminine and childish and floozy and, 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 and not really like firm and not really like conclusive, but unbelievably fertile and powerful and, 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 and a resource and, and visual and explosive and energetic. And of course, then there's this other force that was sort of, you could say, a shadow within me, the serious, down to earth, firm, conclusive inclusive, to the point, heavy gravitas, the operant force of actually getting stuff done, the, the grit, the violence, the, 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 the will to attack the world, the realist, this type of thing, the heavy manly masculinity. And when I sunk down into this force, it was even a bit depressing. It was like allowing my dreams to die, allowing my bubbles to burst. And I sink down into this force. I sink down into it and it becomes like a very heavy rock of gravity. But strangely, the more I, I allow that rock to, 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 to harden and go deeper, eventually it explodes into a shining sun. It's something like the unity or the marriage of these two forces of, of childish, dreamlike, graceful, effeminate energy and, and this, this masculine energy marries together. I make them kiss. I grab their heads and be like, you're going to fall in love with each other. You know that? 
go on, kiss, whatever. I make them do this and it it, it, it creates in me an effective person. It, it, I look at who I was when I look at the start of my journey back, uh, back in, going into college and whatnot. And I was, I, I didn't, I had weak ability to dream. I had, I had no style. I had no spark. I had none of that original stuff. And I also was definitely not going to get anything done. I had neither of these traits really. And I switched one on and I get plenty of things, but it's still not, not enough. I need both of them in my life in order for everything to work together. And so the, the awakening and the switching on of these two forces becomes a becomes a profound thing in order to create me for um to, to transform me into something of a higher grade a more juicy boyo if you so will and i i actually look at the horizons in the future quite confidently if i can keep up my momentum and keep everything going i feel that i am going to constantly graduate graduate as i get more realistic but also get bigger in my vision about what i do i i, I constantly try to place my steps forward so maybe one day I can really really do something profound like work on a high art like a, maybe maybe make films or something like that or really really get into big storytelling storytelling a lot more than just ranting on YouTube in like code for sexuality and stuff like this but but actually something very very conclusive and big and I look at these traits nascent in me and I know that it's not that I am some type of special being or something like that. This is just my my experience of these two forces. But I look at people like Napoleon. I look at people like Julius Caesar. I look about the, look at the people who we, we, we visualize as excellent, who we visualize as the actual most important thing, people of all, the true manly men, the true excellent winners and the successful and whatnot. And I compare them, for example, to often what I encountered along my path, like as I was going through the dream mind and whatnot I came across a lot of very effeminate and um, like I put my hair in a ponytail at one point like very effeminate and um, hippie uh, everything is just like let go uh, flow type people just give into your dreams and all this type of stuff and they're very very unbalanced the Jungians are an awful lot like this very very unbalanced they lack gravitas they lack realism they're sort of they're sort of effeminate and weak and trepid and sometimes they're obsessed with jargon as well to make it worse and um, that, that that's 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 not it that's just too 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 much on one one energy, one force, or the really out of touch artistic types. I, I was that type. But then, of course, going through my gravitas phase, where I got really down to earth and really realistic and effective and whatnot, I met plenty of manly men who like would hold a stake up and a fork and wear a wife beater and say, it's all about getting results, man. And it's all like, it's all about, you know, like just being real and being a man, just be manly and all this type of stuff. And there's something to that as well. There's a gravitas to that that's important. But of course, it doesn't quite hit properly. It's it's one sided. These guys were often like losers. They are often um, not not really what you think they are at all. It's it's not a good vibe. It has no style. They lack style. They lack sort of the sort of freeness. They're a bit stiff in their soul or something like this. And of course, the unity of these two is what I see in the great admirable men that I always look at, look at through history. People like Napoleon, people like Julius Caesar. Like what made Julius Caesar with his squeaky voice stand out so much? And it is actually his ability in its nascent essence, his ability to, to dream big and have this vision of like, we're going to conquer all of France. We're going to conquer all of Gaul. We're going to do this amazing conquest and campaign. I'm going to do this amazing thing. But I'm actually going to get it done. So I'm going to have this big dreaming vision. This big, I can see beyond the horizons. I can think differently. But I'm also got the power and the certain and, 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 and organizational skills to make it happen. Napoleon's the same. Big romantic vision of taking on all of the world and conquering all of France. Big effeminate dreaming and um, magical vision, visionary way of thinking. And even the 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 the, the figure. Um, of the French Revolution, the, the charging woman of, of liberty, you know, it's sort of these big dreams almost appear to us as women, if you will, as animas, as animating dreams, as animating ideas. And Napoleon has this big vision, but he also has the pragmatism and the practicality to get it done. He was very, very um, good logistician, uh, whatever you call that, the guy who does logistics. He was very, very, very good at this type of stuff. And I see nascent in that as almost like the archetype of the actual ubermensch, the actual hero. It's a visionary man. It's not a manly man who's like, on testosterone replacement therapy, therapy and can't really think things through and is a bit like dumb and, and slow and all this type of stuff. That's just a heavy dude with a lot of gravitas. That's good in a way, but weak overall. And it's not some type of floozy like, oh my God, I'm in touch with the universe, all this type of stuff. A hippie dude like, oh my God, I took, I'm, I'm microdosing mushrooms and all this stuff. It's not that either. That's weak and that's that's flippant in some type of way. It's this this marriage, this uni, 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 unity of opposites. And I see it within my 
myself. I see the problems I had with this in all sorts of directions, but I see in myself that 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 end goal of what we're looking for here, the creation of a leader, leader, a man who is a leader, an animated I'm almost artistic in his way of thinking with the muse on his shoulder guided by an energy but also the heaviness and seriousness and assertiveness to get it done the danger and play that is necessary in order to create a true man and I look at this I look at these two forces and see that that, 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 that these are a huge deal for where we find ourselves as like a culture at the moment. I often hear about oh, the West and all this type of stuff. And I've been hearing about the West my whole life. Back when I was in college, I, um, for example, they're all critiquing the West. And then when I was going through that Gravitas period, I was hearing Jordan Peterson talk about, oh, they're critiquing the West. <laughs> and I kind of think to myself, like, what, what the hell is going on? Like, why why is everybody so, why, like, what, what what's this thing about the West? And why does everybody have an opinion about the West? And why does everybody use jazz? jargon when they're talking about the West. I don't care about your jargon. Leave me alone. Stop using your jargon. Oh, this is what the West is. This is what the West is. The, the thing that I think the West lacks, the thing that I feel the West lacks is what I'm talking about right now. The West is not animate. There is no visionary at the head of the West leading the army. Now, if you want to think about this in the context of Jordan Peterson, think about the idea of God is dead. So the idea of God is dead is that you have this thing, God, this this all-powerful symbol, which is representative of the animated force of the universe. And we have this all-powerful symbol. And this symbol dies. God is dead. The, 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 the God falls down and becomes a corpse. And then for that reason, there's no, it's like, it's like we're, the West is an army. And the leader dies. The leader dies and he doesn't know what he's doing. doesn't know where he's going. So he, he's, he's dead. He can't point. He can't lead the army. He can't show the army a vision. He can't organize the army and whatnot. And so in some sense, the God dying is representative of that leader dying. And what we're doing is we're all sitting there and we're all panicking. We're all freaking out. It's like, oh my God, the general just got shot. The general just got shot. He's dead. He's on the floor. He's bleeding out. And th there's this, this, this thing happening in the army right now, in the West right now, and you have half the people who didn't really like the general anyway are sort of saying, well, let's lead the army ourselves in this new direction. Let's go towards the Marxist utopia with our own vision. And they're, they're trying to step up and assert a vision and lead the army and fair play to them. It's a fair game. That's what you can do. But of course, most of the army doesn't want to do it with them because they're kind of crazy and they're weird. All right, And they're demanding this. And they're saying, look, the general's dead. I'll lead you now. I know where we're going now. The general was kind of shit anyway. And you were just because he had authority, that was the only reason you listened to him. And of course, then there's the other half, the more conservative types. And they're just like freaking. They're, they're like, all they can really do is like, the general can't be dead, bro. The, gen the general's, what? no, he's not dead. And it's like, yeah, he's, he's bleeding out on the floor. Well, he's bleeding out. Okay, look, let's try resurrect him. Let's try get him back to life. And they're like pumping. They're trying their best. They're like, please fucking wake up. And there's blood coming out of his mouth. It's, it's very, very ugly stuff. And they're like, you, you, you don't leave us, bro. Don't leave us. Please lead us, lead us. Come on, please, please take us back, take us back. And it's, it's kind of sad nearly because they're desperate because they're so terrified of, of what would happen if, the, if the, the general dies and whatnot. But they're, they're kind of not going anywhere either. And they're panicking and there's blood all over their hands trying to wake, trying to hope, hope that they can resurrect them in some type of sense. But of course, what would make sense to me is that the, 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 the true virtuous would stand up, the truly integrated, the truly animated, the truly individuated would stand up as leaders and paint a visionary picture that then takes the army in a positive direction. Maybe the critique of those those people who are trying to pull towards a new vision is that the vision is a bit twisted, a bit delusional. But then you see people like Nietzsche, that guy who, who I, I began to understand what he really meant, is that what we need to do is we need to actually set a new vision, a futuristic vision, a vision that is inspired. Because look at these, these, these marks Marxists, if you want to call them, or whatever they are, whatever you want to call them, they're inspired, and you're panicking about something that's dying or already dead, and you don't have any vision, you don't have any plan. If he dies, I hope he doesn't, but if he dies, you are fucked. You don't have a plan at all. So why don't we sit down and why don't we actually make a plan? Why don't we make a, a vision? Why don't we get a plan that has gravitas and is serious and understands um, what, what could go wrong, but also has dazzling vision and a, a big picture and all this type of stuff? And this is what would make sense. This is what would unify the army again. It would discipline the army. It would say, quiet you radicals who are coming with your weird, crazy, new, out of touch, delusional vision. But also, wake up, you, 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 you panickers. We need to move forward or we're going we're to get killed if we stay here. There's going to be a mutiny. You're going to end up fighting each other if you're not careful.
And I began to see this and I began to understand what Nietzsche meant by this idea of something like an Ubermensch. Not necessarily that the Ubermensch is some type of religion that we all have to buy into, but he's more like a symbol. He's more like a symbol of when at some point, if what I'm describing is correct, someone's going to have to step up and paint a vision. Someone is going to have to step up and say, this is a new vision, not an old vision and not a weird vision, but a new inspired futuristic vision for us where we are actually going to go and lead things in a positive direction and we're going to assert reality. We're going to have the gravitas, like a man, like remember the girl. The girl didn't didn't want, she needed to feel like I had a vision. It's the same thing here. It's like the West needs to feel that it has its own vision and send us in that direction and paint it for us and grab us by the hand and take us. We need to be led in that type of sense. And it's almost like the Ubermensch is a representation of possibly what that vision is or maybe even the sort of nature of that leader, what, what he will see or what he will point us to towards and it's almost like we're pregnant for that at the moment we're desperate for that we're all panicking in the corners being and there's no one there and there's disorientation and nobody knows what's going on and it's like it's like that's just around the cusp in our collective psyche we're waiting for that animated spark that new hero to show up and stand there like napoleon like julius cesare and cast that vision upon the chaos and suddenly all of our heads snap in the same direction and the west is saved so what Nietzsche said in response to these ideas that he noticed, he noticed that this sort of chaos and implosion was coming and he suggested that everything is going to get very, very dodgy. Everybody's going to become more brainwashed, more last man-like, more, more unthinking, more, more cowardly, more fearful or more delusional. All of this bad stuff is going to happen. Humanity is going to go through a very, very terrible bottleneck. And what he saw that we needed is a hundred well-placed men. He ne we need people in visionary positions. We need people with visionary minds with in, in important positions in order to change the course of everything. He spoke about the education system, for example, in Germany at the time that was becoming very uh, focused on rote learning and stuff like this. This is when the beginning of all this stuff was starting to happen. And he was like, this is going to churn out a load of jargonites and nobody's going to have an animated mind. And we have to be very, very careful what we're doing here. We're going to ruin the future if we don't be careful. And he saw that if we just get the right people in the right place, the people with sparked minds who can think differently in, in visionary people, we grow gravitas and seriousness to them as well. If we can get those people in the right place, we can change the entire tide of everything that's coming. For example, the youth determines the future. So if you turn the youth through a bad education system, you're going to have a terrible, terrible future. That's pretty much what's going on. And I'm beginning to understand what I am doing in the context of all this. As I said, personally, I want to get into a position where I make things that are visionary and spark millions of minds all at once. The effect of great art. That is really one of my big goals. But also, I work with people. I work with people as clients. I teach them this type of stuff because I understand that on some level, I believe that I was someone who lacked this ability to do this stuff. And I went searching for teachers and no one re could really sit me down and, and make me understand that this is what I needed. You need to animate your mind, but then you also need to develop gravitas to hold that mind down and be certain and assertive. I had to learn it through making mistakes and whatnot. But I understand that this this is these are skills, these are tools, these are directions, these are things that education system and, and and jobs and all this type of stuff they never ever ever teach us properly but these are the the realities of of your development of taking steps forward that are really really important in order to become successful you need to be unifying these two sort of disparate forces the the feminine maybe dreaming dynamic animated thinking that makes you a visionary and also balancing it with firmness and assertiveness and an actual spine and an actual grip on reality that is needed in order for you to set forth and make a plan and get stuff done and whatnot so I see myself as also working in that project, working on lifting people up and teaching them and actually educating them. Educate to mean to draw out, to bring out of people their, their, their excellence, their animated power, their, all of the things that they might be lacking. Some people might come in and they've got too much floosiness and you bring out of them the, the gravitas. Some people might have too much gravitas and are serious and a bit sterile and you show them how their animated energy comes along and, and with the intended goal of trying to craft, trying to put, trying to flick the dominoes so that maybe, maybe some of them might turn out to be one of those 100 excellent men that will actually stand forward and help us get a vision and a grip on this army so that we send it in a healthy and fertile and animated and life-loving direction. 
So if you so wish to work with me on all these projects, if you want to come along and work with me and I will show you how to get your animated mind switched on and how to get the gravitas to hold you down and get make sure that you it gets things actually tactilely done. You actually get yourself well positioned in society so you're doing well and, and with your health and your, your wealth and your happiness and all this type of stuff. Pop down into the link in the description. What you're going to do is you're going to chat to one of my Boyo squad members. You might remember Laszlo from a while back. He's doing quite a lot the, the chats at the moment so if you're talking to him that could be the case there might be another boy out there as well who knows it's a lottery god knows what you'll end up talking to and um, we'll see what happens but nonetheless that is how things are working at the moment so please pop down there and have a chat we've scaled to a team is what i'm trying to say things are going quite good so thank you very much for all your support all your juice all your love and all the animated juiciness and all the gravitas i hope you unify it all i hope the animas come i hope the animas are smashing on your door and being like let me in let me in i need Need, I need the boyo juice ca- contained within this house. I hope the animas are torturing you. I will talk to you later, people. Stay well, stay juicy. Bye bye.